Hallelujah. I'm feeling good. How about you? I'm feeling good. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm feeling good right now. How you doing, Chelsea? I'm feeling good. Hallelujah. Muy bueno. Hallelujah. I could just do this for the next half hour, but I got some stuff I got to get done here. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. Hallelujah. We got some um, shifting happening around here, not just in the spirit. Uh, we got some. Ha. Huh. We got some leadership shifting happening going on in a good way. Amen. Hallelujah. Is, is, um, is um, Gina still here? Gina, are you here? Come on up. Gina Harwood is here. Come on, give a, give a hand to Gina Harwood. <laughs> Gina has nice shoes, my wife says. I... Uh, um, Gina is our director of First Impressions now. She's taken over our First Impressions team. It's actually been a while now. Uh, but I neglected to, uh, to announce it just because I'm not really good at remembering that stuff. Uh, but so she's our um, director of first impressions. Uh, that's our greeters and all kinds of other good things. And so here, here's, here's how Gina helps your life. You see, um, I know that when you got saved, you recognize that Jesus came to be a servant. And therefore, he empowers us to be servants. Right, amen? No, it's a good word, right? And so some people want to be super spiritual, and here's the way you get to be super spiritual. You hold a baby or hold a door for somebody, right? You actually get to serve other people. That's the glory of the church. We get to serve other people. And so, you know, if you're like, man, I, I am convicted because the Lord Jesus served me by coming to earth and dying on a cross for my sins, I probably should serve others since that's what God is expecting of me. Gina is here to lift that burden for you. She's a burden lifter. And so if you'll see Gina or any of her uh, team in the lobby after service, they would love to help you get on the First Impressions team so you can just look happy and hold doors for people and serve Jesus. Amen? So she's in charge of our First Impressions. We have a new Revival Kids director, and she is, oh, there she is. Come on up. Miriam, Miriam Thomas. Uh, Miriam finally heard the Lord. Oh, no, let me say it this way. She finally obeyed the Lord and left Gainesville and moved here. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. And, um, and uh, she uh, was on staff. She served in children's ministry at her last church. And uh, she has a heart for kids. She's actually anointed to do that, even more important. Uh, and uh, so she is taking over, uh, actually she's ta she has taken over Revival Kids. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but we have our elementary kids in worship here, uh, which is super cool because we want families to worship together. Amen. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, one of our longtime uh, Revival Kids workers this morning was uh, talking to the kids worshiping here. And first service is like, you know, hey, what's this? She's like, and then one of the kids is like, this is so cool. And they're like, oh, what's so cool? They're like, oh, I just, this is awesome in here. And she's like, oh, what, what do you mean? She goes, well, I was dropping off my younger sibling back there, and I saw angels in the sanctuary. And when I came here in worship, I saw them where I saw them in the sanctuary, and I saw where the certain, and so like, they're like involved in what we're doing. Amen? They need to see our angels, right? That's, we got to have them in the room. And so uh, Miriam is a, uh, uh, taking over Revival Kids, and she's going to expand it. And last but not least, our very own Sarah Pagano has, um, she was bumped by uh, uh, Miriam Thomas, uh, and she is now, uh, she was our Revival Kids director for about a minute, right? About 30. And she is now our um, director of community life. And so all of our events... All of our community life events, all of our church family stuff, uh, she is in charge of that now. So when you have a Revival Kids question and she go, you go to her, she goes like this. And she points to Miriam, all right? And so why don't you stand with me? We're going to pray for them. We have their, uh, their spouses come up for those. Uh, do you see a trend here in our leaders? I'm not trying to say, you know, maybe some men should step up a little bit. But um, I am saying, um, oh, yeah, come on up. 
Um, John wasn't here first service. I, I didn't know. Uh, we got to make fun of John not being here first service. We made all kind of references to him not coming and all kind of jokes about his salvation and whatnot. But he's actually, he's actually, he's actually one of, he actually serves in the house and he does lots of, he's one of our leaders. So I'll uh, stretch your hand if you will. We're just going to pray for them. Honey, if you will come up and pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we, Oh, you're coming behind me. All right, well. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for these. We pray for grace over their lives. mm, ah, We thank you for the anointing that is upon them already. Father, we thank you that you have called them and gifted them to this office. And we thank you that you bring people to support them in what they're doing. Father, we just, we thank you. Wow. Shabbat. Katara. Sandedede. Yeah, that's a good one right there. And Father, we, we, we thank you. And Lord, we pray, we ask right now that you would join to them people who serve, have a like-minded spirit to serve. You see, in this house, we believe that God doesn't call people, he calls families. That's a good word. He calls families. And so we expect families to grow in Christ. That's why we're kind of a family church. We're going to be in relationship here. But Father, that you would anoint them in all they're doing in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, give a, give a hand to them if you would. Hallelujah. If you've got your Bible, you can get it ready. You can turn to Luke chapter 3. I will be there shortly. As you know, uh, everybody going on the mission trips wearing our mission trip t-shirt. It's kind of our tradition around here. We had a mission trip t-shirt and we, whoa. Mm. Yeah, how about that? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Help me to stand through this service and get everyone whacked in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> So, hey, I got a couple of cool things. I meant to say this earlier. Uh, Revival Pantry, that's where uh, uh, some of us go out and feed the, uh, I say us as a family. I don't actually do it. But, um, but, but, but we as a house do it. Uh, on September 7th, um, they fed 61 people and uh, 18 people got saved. You know you're in church too long if that doesn't excite you. I mean, like, if it, I mean, it's not really a big deal unless it's, like, your family member getting saved. Then, then you know what I mean? Like, it's, oh, 18 people there. Oh, got saved, huh? Hmm, change the destiny of 18 families. Hmm, you know? That's a big deal, amen? amen. Come on, we don't take it lightly. Uh, on the next, or the three days later, uh, in the prison ministry, um, uh, six people got saved, which is... <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. And on the, the next day, they, went, they were in the prison again ministering, and five people got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Hallelujah. Six got saved, five got filled. We're going for 100, but we'll take that. I mean, 100%. We'll take that. Can you imagine what would happen in the, the lives of prisoners if a revival broke out? You, Imagine what would happen in the lives of Christian if revival would break out. Imagine what happened in the church if uh, the Holy Ghost broke out. Hallelujah. I didn't say that out loud. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, we're still in our uh, Power of Heaven message series, and uh, I'm, I'm expecting some of you to get touched with the Power of Heaven today. Amen? Amen. Today. Say today. today. Could be my day. Say it. Could be my day. Yeah, you're terrible at repeating things, but we'll work on that. We'll work on that. Hallelujah. As we've studied in the old, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, there are two, what I have come up with, two motifs of, of, of the Holy Spirit being active in the Scriptures. And uh, put them up right now. The two that I have come up with, these two motifs in the Hebrew Bible, was the house of God and the anointed messenger. Uh, what you see often is that um, uh, we see uh, first in the garden, of course, the garden of Eden, Eden, God lived, he dwelt, came down and dwelt with Adam and Eve in the garden. And uh, then we know Jacob, of course, encountered God in the wilderness and said, this is clearly the house of God and I did not know it. Uh, we see later that there was a tabernacle that was built that they carried through the wilderness, and this tabernacle represented the resting place of God, where God would come down and meet with the people. And this is where God would dwell uh, in spirit form. Are, are you with me? 
And they would carry this Ark of the Testimony around, and uh, at certain times they would stand outside their tent, and the glory of God would come down, and it was the house of God. People couldn't just go anywhere, and it wasn't just where two or three are gathered, there I am. God would only go to specific places that were built specifically how he said, in a specific timing, and come at a specific way when specific conditions were met. And God would come down, and that would be the house of God. The other motif that we see in the scripture is the anointed messenger. Now, often uh, these anointed messengers were the ones who actually wrote the Hebrew Bible. Uh, uh, Many times uh, the Lord would um, signify who he is calling for a certain season by a charismatic manifestation. Do you know what that means? A charismatic manifestation would be like um, the spirit came down upon Saul and he prophesied with the prophets. Right? Or uh, when Elisha caught Elijah's mantle. Uh, There was many prophets, but he wanted to know if he was going to be the prophet. And so he grabbed the mantle, he struck the water, and the waters parted. There was a charismatic manifestation. There was some spirit thing that manifested in the natural that signified this is the one that God has anointed. And because they had this charismatic manifestation, they were to be listened to and they were to be heeded as either the prophet of God or the king of God's people. These were the manifestations uh, in the old covenant over and over and over again. And, and uh, uh, the prophets would say, in the word of the Lord came to me in this season. The word, and so that literally the spirit of God came upon me in this season and, and I spoke. I'm, I'm plowing a little bit right now because I feel like the Lord needs to move a little bit in the room. And I believe he will. So let's just stay open to that. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You know, we're having 11 babies in this church right now. There's 11 babies on the way. We fertile. We're just a fertile church. We're good ground, I'll tell you what. We are good ground. You forgot a notebook, Mike. And so this anointed messenger would have these charismatic manifestations. They would uh, be miracles. You know, and there's some crazy ones that we see in the Bible also. Some are like really weird, Corey. Like they would even weird me out, and I'm into weird stuff, right? Like, remember, remember, remember Elijah? You remember, like, he calls down fire, and it consumes the offering, and it consumes all the false priests around, right? Remember when the, remember when the, the prophet chased down a whole company of people and murdered them with a jawbone? That's weird. With a jawbone. How, how, how slow do you have to run to get murdered by somebody carrying a jawbone? How unmotivated to stay alive do you have to be? I mean, after the first couple dozen, you got to figure like, he's murdering people with that jawbone. I'm leaving now. Yeah. Right? Like, he's swinging the jawbone. I mean, I understand there's like a certain level of, I got to watch what's happening right now. This is, this is, I got to. But after a while, you got to be, wait a minute, he's going to come for me soon. It was a weird mystical magnetic jawbone that just drew false prophets to it. And he murdered them in mass. It's crazy. That's just crazy. But there was these charismatic manifestations that happened in the old... I just... And so all through, uh, all through the Hebrew Bible, that was the sign of who God has chosen. The way he would prove that he's chosen... I mean, anybody could say they're anointed, right? We got that in the church today. You just get your favorite anointed preacher, preach his messages, and say that you're anointed, right? Like, we have that now. We have carbon, I shouldn't have said that, huh, honey? So we have carbon copies in the church. I, okay, I'm, forgive me, Jesus. I'm going to be nice this service, I promise. I'm feeling feisty, though. <clears throat> I'm going to Mexico, I'm feeling feisty. I get to scream in Mexico. That's a good part of going to Mexico. I get to scream and wave a rag. That's, it's, it's preacher heaven. Shaba. 
Um, yes. Okay. So the way God would prove, like people could say that they're called, but God would show who he called by putting a spirit upon them. And then they would be able to do the God stuff. Say God stuff. They would get to do the God stuff because God put his spirit upon them. Now, we know that not everybody who had God's spirit upon them handled it well. Not everybody stewarded it well. That does not mean God has not put his anointing upon them. That means they did not steward the anointing well, right? Amen? We, I mean, we have that in the church today, right? Not everybody who's anointed is, is, is really perfect at carrying that anointing, right? I just feel like the Lord is telling me right now, he's about to anoint some people today. And I'm not just saying that for hype, I don't say that, but I feel it in my spirit right now in a significant way. And there's a burning beginning to happen in some of your bellies right now. And God is going to do something significant in your life. Amen? And so, ha. Huh. And so we had this house of God where the glory of God dwelt, where people would go and uh, they would get their sins atoned for. They would do certain uh, offerings is where uh, God would be. And there was the charismatic anointed messenger. Now, when Jesus came, these two motifs, as I see them, these two motifs were married, All right? These two motifs came together. And, uh, and, and here's what's interesting. When Jesus came, the new covenant had not started yet. This was a closing of the, the old covenant. Jesus came at the closing of the old covenant, married these two motifs. Uh, we see in Luke chapter 3, verse 22, uh, if you brought your Bible, you can see it there. It says, and the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Don't you like to hear God say that to you, that I'm pleased? All my ones out there, that's what you need to be focusing on. God's actually pleased, all you perfectionists. Perfectionist, you need to hear this. God is actually happy with you. The critical thing that you see the world through, that's your lens. That's not reality. <laughs> that's not reality. That's the lens you see the world through. And so the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Now, we saw the Spirit descending upon people who are going to be the charismatic messenger of God, right? And so we see kind of a continuation of the prophets of old. And then, that was in Jesus' baptism. He got water baptized. The Spirit of the Lord led him out into the wilderness, right? And while he was out in the wilderness, he kicked the devil in the teeth, right? Right? Amen? And then he came out of the wilderness. We see here in Luke chapter 4. And it's out, now it says, Jesus, watch this, full of the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. And so now we have not only the charismatic messenger who bears the glory of God, we have the house of God where the glory of God dwelt in one person. That's never happened. This is the marrying of the two motifs. This is what the new covenant is based off of. Shaba. Amen? And so here's, here's where that's good news. Now, never before in history was this a promise to people that we walk in today. Never before did we have the opportunity to be the house of God. Never happened before Jesus. Jesus was the first one. But Jesus, of course, he lived a perfect life, and then he was murdered on the cross, right? Now, let, let me just say that. Let me just talk about that for a second. You know that doesn't make any sense, right? You, you, know, you know the fact that Jesus was murdered, and because of it, we're saying, you know that doesn't make any sense, that is not, there's nothing logical about that. You can get so Christian that you can kind of take it for granted that it's an accepted fact. But the fact that a guy who lived a couple thousand years ago was murdered, I get to go to heaven. Like, how are those two things? It does not make any sense, Kellyanne. Right, Robin? Like, you know, this doesn't, it's not logical. We can go to school and people can teach it to us, but it doesn't mean it makes sense. To some people, though, the, the round earth doesn't make sense. You know, so, like, people will believe all kinds of stuff. People believe all kinds of stuff. People don't believe scientists these days, which is kind of funny. People with no scientific background, no more than the scientists, which I find funny, John. That's just, to me, I find it funny. I'm not going to go down that road, Corey. I really want to, but I'm not going to. Here's what I say. <clears throat> The average, okay, let me say this. <laughs> Try to be nice. 
as we, as we tell people about Jesus in the world, we accept it as a fact that he lived, died, rose again, and through faith in Christ, we're actually saved. Now, people who don't believe in him, they don't know that. And we talk to them like they should know that. But they can't understand that. Now, here's the funny part. When I argue with non-believers, they somehow feel like they know more about this than we do who actually live it. Yeah. Right? It's funny how like the non-believer, uh, how the non-Christ follower somehow feels like they have more wisdom than the people who've given their lives to studying something. Yeah. Are, are you, you hear what I'm saying? It's like the people who have come up with medical facts by studying Facebook. We call that dumb <laughs> or ignorant, right? I mean, you can choose. There's a whole bunch of words, Kellyanne, that I could come up with. None of them are flattering. I will believe the people who have studied this the least, right? Who've come into contact with it the least. Like, okay, I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not angry anymore. We need to have grace for people who just are ignorant. You know, like small kids who do really stupid things. And I have to tell parents all the time, kids are stupid. Like, they're just, they're just not smart. They do dumb, like they run into traffic. And you're like, and then, you, then, then we will ask them, why did you run into traffic? Because they're dumb. They don't know any better. They don't know. You walk into the room and the baby's been, took off his diaper and put it all over the walls. And you're like, why would you do that? Because <laughs> they're just not smart, you know? Like, don't put that in your mouth. What are you doing? <laughs> Kids aren't bright, honey. They're just not bright. That's, like, that's why they need adults. Yeah. Kids can't raise themselves. Nope. They, they need adults, right? Uh, because, because they don't know. <clears throat> Unbelievers don't know. They don't know it because it takes revelation to get saved. See, now, when people try to argue with me about salvation as if they know more, I say, well, I don't know. I just met Jesus. I actually met him, and that's when I started believing in him. Like, like I believe that this music stand is here because I see it here. I, I, now, maybe you don't see the music stand. That doesn't mean it's not there. Right? Like, if I'm blocking it, you could say, there is no music stand there except everybody behind me can see it. And so people who are on the other side of the block say, no, no, it's not there. No, no, you can't see it. Doesn't mean it's not there. I've never actually been to China, but I've heard enough people say it's there that I believe it's there. It doesn't make sense. It's kind of like, like how when people say these faith healers are fake. Like, like the Benny Hins, oh, it's all fake. I'm like, how many tens of thousands of people have they gotten across the stage to say that they got healed? You know how expensive that would be to hire that many actors? Like, I know these guys are making money, but not that kind of money. Like, you know how hard it would be to orchestrate that night after night, week after week? I mean, you would think that people would recognize the same people on the shows coming in as the healed actors, right? Like, at some point, you'd be like, wait a minute, didn't he get healed of Crohn's disease in D Detroit? And didn't he get healed of being blind in Michigan? And didn't he get a heal healed of uh, scoliosis in Miami? Like, aren't these the same people giving? But no, that's not what happens. There's actually every single healing meeting, there's new people coming up and getting healed. But the super bright people who don't get it said, no, no. It's all fake. Even though there are hundreds of thousands of people who have testimonies of getting healed, somehow the non-healed are smarter and say, no, 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 it's all fake. Like, really? Based on what? Your skepticism? Like, wow, that's, wow, you're pretty impressed with yourself to come to that conclusion. Like, I am smarter than everybody who's ever claimed to have met Jesus. Like, yikes. Pride comes before the fall. Might want to just humble yourself a little bit and open the door to a possibility that he's God. Just crack the door and say, maybe, since I don't know, alive right now, there's about a billion people who claim to have met him. You'd think more than five or six people would be convincing. At a billion, it's kind of hard to argue. To claim to, I mean, is this making sense? Are we on the same page here? Honey, are we good? I'm a little feisty right now, huh? Pray for me. Pray for me. So listen, 
The reason I'm asking you, the reason I'm saying this is we need to have mercy. We need to have grace with people. People have a cloud over their mind that they think that they know better than a billion people. A billion people. It's a lot of people. So Jesus, the anointed one, who bore the Spirit, Kellyanne, he bore the Spirit, <clears throat> he walked, and then he said, hey, it's better that I leave. Now, no prophet has ever said that. Now, some prophets said, get me out of here, God, I'm done. Right? I, I'm like, I don't like these people. Get, just, I'm done, right? Elijah, Elijah excuse me, like, was like, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm done now. God just kind of took him, right? Uh, Jesus said, no, it's better that I leave. And they're like, how can that possibly be better that you leave? And uh, I, 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 I use this example. <clears throat> um, we're going on the mission trip, and uh, we were doing our mission team training. And uh, we talked about, you know, our ministry protocols, similar protocols that we have here. And we started talking about deliverance, right? Now, not a lot of people have a lot of experience with deliverance ministry. Now, at Revival Life Church, we have deliverance happen almost every single meeting. And you don't see it because what we like to do is get people saved and start dealing with the strongholds in their life. And then the enemy just kind of has to go. You don't have to do a wrestling match with it, right? You don't have to start fighting off to hand out vomit bags. You just, if, you, if there's no place for the enemy to leave, then he just moves out eventually, right? Like that's just, that's kind of our theory of deliverance. And we feel like it, anybody can have any demon they want. We're not going to make your demon go away if you want it, right? Like, that's yours. Do what you want, right? That's your life, right? We're not running your life for you. You want to be oppressed, be oppressed. And so, but sometimes we go to third world countries, it gets a little more dramatic, right? And so we told the team, we had a meeting. We said, listen, if you start to pray for someone, they start to manifest demons. They, you know, begin to growl. Their eyes roll back in their head. They start foaming at the mouth, clenching their fists. They look like they're about to attack you. Here we want you to do. Figure it out, right? That's what we tell them. Figure it out. We want you to know that you are the one that God chose to pray for that person. That's why it's happening. So how do I know if it's working? How do I know what to do? Well, if you're praying and nothing happens, try something else, right? Like what you're, if what you're doing is not working, do something else, right? Don't scream in tongues for 20 minutes and then ask me if they're free. Like, okay, that didn't work. I'm tired and they're still bound. Let's try something else. And we like tell them things like, maybe get them saved. Let Jesus move in so the enemy has to move out, right? Are we, are like, you know, like, but, you know, every now and then, this is how you work out gifts. You work it out by working it out. You just work it out. And so Jesus was like, hey, I'm going to leave. And they're like, whoa, whoa, we're just getting started here. He's like, nah, work it out. <laughs> I'm going to go. We're like, well, wait, 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 get some, what, I need some instructions. He's like, uh, why don't you pray for a couple days? Figure it out. And so they did. So they went into the upper room and they started praying, right? And they prayed. I don't know, I don't know what kind of prayer they prayed because they knew that Jesus came back from the dead. And you got to figure they thought now that he's back from the dead. Now, like the going away had already happened. And he returned because, you know, he went away and returned like the prophecy, right? He came back and, uh, and he, now he's like, no, no, I'm leaving for good this time. And they're like, oh, this is, this is not going to be good. He's like, no, no, it's good. He's like, how can that possibly be good, right? How can that, are you with me? Are we, are we tracking today? How can it possibly be good? And on the day of Pentecost, they prayed, and the Spirit came down, right? It came down, landed upon them, and a bunch of people received the Holy Ghost. They spilled out into the streets, and Peter started preaching to them what had happened. And people then said, man, I don't know what's happening right now. The disciples got filled, but now there's people who are just there for the religious festival. They saw, they understood the manifestation of the Spirit. They understood that God would pour His Spirit out on people and they would be anointed messengers. They saw God was doing something. They said, hey, how do we get saved? How do we get converted? How do we get this wholeness of God, this sozo? How do we get this? And Peter said very clearly, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he said, here's what you do. It's not complicated. Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, that was not some formula. That was because people were getting baptized as part of the religious festival for other reasons. They're like, oh, I've been baptized. Have you been baptized in faith in Jesus Christ? No, that's what you need to do. Get baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And watch this. You will. Say will. will. 
you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it happened. And people got filled. Now, here is what's really exciting about this. Because this dual motif of the house of God and the charismatic anointed leader that God has anointed was married in Jesus. And now on Pentecost, it continues in us. Can you say amen? amen. That's big news. That's big news. That's big news. We don't just have to go and follow rules anymore because Pentecost is the encounter with God where the language of God is written on our hearts. It gets written on our hearts. And out of that baptism, out of that infilling of the Spirit of God and the love being written on our heart, we begin to speak in the language of God. And we get to speak in it for, for our own building up and for the benefit of others. Can you say amen? I feel like that's good news. I feel like the anointing is flowing in this room. I wish you would receive it. I would kick it into you if I could, but I just don't have that kind of time. I would chase you with a jawbone. <laughs> There's an illustration. Ha. Huh. You praying for me, Corey? Are we, you're not with me at all, are you? You're not with me at all. He's in his own zone right now. Hallelujah. 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 So, <clears throat> ha. So we understand that this infilling of the Spirit, it's a meeting place between the divine and the natural realm. It's a meeting place between the divine realm and the natural realm. And everywhere the Spirit of God is becomes a divine place, Raquel becomes a holy place everywhere the Spirit is. And so we kind of come up with this little graphic to kind of explain it. You see, when we get filled with the Spirit, Paul kind of taught us this way. You know, the Holy Spirit not only empowers us for those ecstatic experiences, those mountaintop experiences, those overcoming experiences, those times where we feel like we're on top of the world or when the glory of God falls on us and we feel like that we're in, it just encased in his love it's, and, and, and we're like in another realm. That's not the only thing that Holy Spirit does. Not only does he empower us, but he also sustains us. He also carries us through the hard times. He's also there as, 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 as Corey sang this morning, uh, and I'd like to give him credit for that song, but we know it was some guys in Australia who write too many songs. Uh, I say that just out of jealousy. Um, how he is the fourth man in the fire with us. He's the one who walks alongside us in the battle. He's the one that we're not alone when times get tough. Holy Spirit is actually here with us to empower us and sustain us and carry us through, through hard times. Yeah, come on. He is there the one that when we're dry, we can pray in the Holy Ghost and, and, and rivers begin to bubble up within our belly. It doesn't stop just when we're on ecstatic moments, when the worship team is hitting the right key and the right singer is singing at the right time. He's also there when we're dry and we just begin to pray in the Spirit and that Spirit just begins to bubble up on the inside of us, bringing life from deep, 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 from the deep of God, brings life to us and begins to bubble up, not just for our edification, but for others. This is the plan of God. And so we see that when we get filled with the Spirit, we're called to walk in the Spirit. We walk in relationship with the Spirit of God, allowing Him to lead us and to, and to guide us and to dictate our lives. This is why I challenge you all to, to journal, to hear what God is telling you and write it down and then read it. And then read it. I, I normally, uh, I don't want to go into that right now. I read my journal a lot so I can remember who, what God thinks about me. Let me just say it that way. And we need to do that. And so we walk in the Spirit as God has revealed to us. But as we walk in the Spirit, we pray down the Spirit. We pray in the Holy Ghost. We pray in the natural. We pray till the Spirit manifests in this realm. And when we pray in the Spirit long enough, we get caught up in the Spirit. Now, that's what I like. I like getting caught up in the Spirit. That happened to some of our, our, our what are they, elementary and middle-aged kids today. Are they elementary? Elementary, elementary age kids today. They got caught up in the Spirit and began to see the things of the Spirit happening in the room. And when we get caught up in the Spirit and we start seeing the reality as God sees it, because what He shows us is the reality. And that's what this is supposed to be being conformed to. This natural realm is supposed to be conformed to that reality. And as we see that reality, we then want to walk in that new reality that we call walking in the Spirit. 
Is this making sense? All right, I need you all to give me some feedback here. I'll get insecure, I'll start yelling more, I'll do all kinds of stuff. I'm just, a, I'm, I'm a frail man here. I have, man, I'm one minute. All right. <clears throat> not likely. So Paul understood that not only do we need to be filled with the Spirit, we need to grow in the things of the Spirit. <clears throat> <clears throat> Um, God has been challenging our leadership team to purposefully build a new wineskin that he will be filling. Um, he has shown us the wine he wants to pour out, and he has tasked us with building a wineskin to receive this new wine. Now, we have builders in the house, and you know, if you're going to build any structure of substance, you have to plan the whole thing out ahead of time. You have to plan the whole thing out ahead of time. Because if you don't, you're going to start building stuff that you later have to tear down. And no builder wants to tear apart things they've already built. <clears throat> and so if you want to put a bathroom in a certain part of your house, you've got to lay the pipe down before you ever put the dirt down, before you ever put the concrete down, before you ever put the tile down, before you ever put the walls up and the roof on. You've got to have the plumbing done ahead of time. And so if you're going to have wine and you need to put it in a wineskin, you've got to find out, is it new wine or is it old wine? Because you put old wine in old wineskins. You can't put new wine in old wineskins because they will burst. And I just wonder so often, I, I want to talk to people and I want to ask them who are, who are believers, I want to say, well, what is God building in your life? Where is this whole thing going? What, 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 what is the framework, this place that you're at in Christianity? Are you actually growing? Are you going somewhere or are you just going through the motions? Are you just in the midst of something that will have to be torn down later so God can build a bigger structure in your life? How long are you laying the foundation? Will you ever get on to bigger things? And so for our house, we are now laying down the foundation of things that we believe God is going to fill in the future. And we think this has much to do with a better understanding of Holy Spirit and His ministry on the earth. Can you say amen? And so Paul said, listen, listen, not only are we supposed to be filled with the Spirit, we're supposed to grow in the things of the Spirit. And he wrote this letter to the church in Corinth, and he wasn't really excited about what was happening in Corinth at the time. Uh, they were Christians. I need you to understand that. They were Christians. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I, I challenge you to go and read that whole chapter. It's really, really something. He, he writes to them, and he's like, he says to them in, in verse 14, he starts saying, hey, um, the natural man can't accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him. This is what we're talking about when unbelievers cannot understand the revelation of a Christian. It's foolishness to them because they do not have the spirit in them to interpret what's happening, right? And, and if you're kind of in between belief and unbelief today, I'm not insulting you. This, I mean, it's like in, if you didn't go to engineering school, you don't understand engineering. It is what it is. Engineers understand things I don't understand because I'm not an engineer. It's not, not complicated, right? Watch this. He says, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised, meaning when spiritual things happen... I need the Spirit in me to understand by the Spirit what God, who is Spirit, is doing. Otherwise, He is communicating something that my natural mind cannot understand. God is Spirit. He's communicating spiritually, and I have to have the Spirit to understand what He is communicating, right? This is what He's saying. He says, verse 15, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. I don't have time to get into that. Verse 16, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We have a, we have a, 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 we have a value here at Revival Life Church that we embrace, and we say, you do not know what's going on in someone else's heart unless you ask them. God is not giving you insight to say, oh, he did that out of selfish motive. Oh, he's really uh, inward vocal. Oh, he did that because that. Because you don't know anybody unless you ask them what's going on inside them. Amen? Amen? We like to think we do. I've heard people say, oh, I like to sit in the mall and just read people's soul. No, what you're doing is evil. Don't do that. I like to just look at people. Well, just stop it, right? Just stop doing that. You're not allowed to go and muck around in people's lives unless they give you authority to. 
Otherwise, you're going through another door and you're not getting God. Hallelujah. So the Bible says you can only know what's in a man. Only a man knows what's in his own heart, right? Only know the heart of, only knows man by his own heart. You only know God by the Spirit of God, right? And so we only know what's happening in someone's life if they tell us. And so in every Bible Life Church, we just have a value on relationship. We don't let people just, no, but I have a gift. Great, awesome, but we don't have relationship. Well, I just, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a. Yeah, you're not someone who wants to be known. So, you know, let's work out some of that inner stuff. Once you're, you know, not scared to be known, then we can minister together, yeah. right? And so that, yeah, some people get a little, mm, I like to hide though. Uh, we don't get to hide behind God here. We need to be, we need to be known. That's a good word. And so, but he says in verse 16, but we have the mind of Christ. How do you have the mind of Christ? By having the spirit of Christ. You have the mind of God on the inside of you and you receive his spirit, right? So the next verse is a new chapter, but Paul didn't write in chapters. Verse one of chapter three says, and I, brothers, could not speak to you as spiritual men. Ouch. These are Christians he's writing to. I couldn't write to you as spiritual men, but as the men of the flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. How would you like him to tell you that? How would you like, how'd you like Paul to write a letter? How, what, I wonder what Paul, what letter Paul would write to our church. I wonder what Paul would write to your family. Would he write, wow, I can write the deep things of God too, like he did in, in, in Ephesians. Like, let me, let me just go deep on you. Let me just go, let me just start deep, right? Or, or, did he, or would he have to be like, listen, I got milk that I brought for you, but I see I have to water it down, right? Like, I want meat. How about you? You know, I'm a meat eater. I'm a carnivore. We were called to eat animals. Amen. We know that because they taste good. The Bible says, what's it say? Vegetables are those with little faith. We love, we love, love pepper, all phases of growth. I'm just, I'm joking, of course, but a little bit. <laughs> now listen, God saved the best for us. You know that? Amen. You know how I know he saved the best for this new covenant? Pork. Amen. Listen, because of the fall, they didn't get to eat pork. But when you come into the new covenant, you get to eat the magical beast that is a pig. Pigs turn slop into bacon. That's magic. And if you don't come to faith in Christ, you don't get it. No pork for you. So for no other reason, like maybe the infilling of the Spirit is not enough. Maybe eternal salvation is not enough. Bacon. Bacon is the reason to come into the new covenant. I think that's a good word. Okay, I'm, 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 let me wrap up here. Hold on. He says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able. You are still fleshly. He's like, you're not discerning things spiritually. We have to discern things spiritually by the Spirit. We don't want to dumb everything down at Revival Life Church. We don't want milky water to serve every Sunday and just... Okay, I'm not going there. We want to go, we want, we want to appraise things spiritually here. We want to know what God is doing. And we want to build a wineskin that values that. And so you, me, the house of Revival Life Church, how do we grow spiritually? What's the, what's the key to supernatural growth? It's praying in the spirit. It just kind of makes sense. If we want to grow in the spirit, we will pray in the spirit. The key to a supernatural life is to pray in the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? amen? Is to pray in tongues. We need to pray in the Holy Ghost. It is the promise of God for you that you would speak in the tongues of angels and you would connect with the Spirit of God by the Spirit. Does that make sense, Kellyanne? It just makes sense to me. Does that make sense to you? It just kind of makes sense. If God is Spirit, I connect to Him by Spirit who lives on the inside of me. And He gives me a prayer language where I pray things. I don't even know what I'm praying, but it's the Spirit of God who's praying through me the things of God and the mind of God to have the will of God manifest in my life. We need to pray Pray in the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? We need to pray in the Holy Ghost. We don't need to hide it for the back room. 
We don't hide it for life groups. We don't hide it in your little prayer closet because we might scare somebody with God. Like, no, that's not what it's for. And it always was for this. The prophets prophesied of this in 1 Corinthians 14. Paul made it clear for us. It says, In the law is written by men of strange tongues, and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people, even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Verse 22. So then, tongues. In the old covenant, he called it stammering lips. P- strange people with stammering lips. Paul makes it very clear. So then, tongues. Say tongues. Oh. Tongues are a sign. Well, we're supposed to hide it because we might scare non believers, right? Oh, wait a minute. Not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. (laughs) So the Bible actually says we're not supposed to hide tongues. And we're not supposed to be scared if unbelievers come to church and hear us praying tongues. Why? Because it's a sign. I'm not the sign. Corey's not the sign. But prophecy is a sign. Not to unbelievers, but those who believe. But every spiritual person on, on YouTube these days are teaching us to prophesy to the unbelievers. And hide tongues from the believers. I love it. It's just not biblical. Is that, can I say that? Is that all right? Am I, allowed to, am I allowed to point to the Bible? Am I allowed to point to the Bible? Now listen, if God gives you a prophetic word for someone, go on in. I don't care if they believe or not believe. Prophesy to their spirit. I'm not, don't hear what I'm not saying. But the Bible says that tongues is a sign for unbeliever. Whoever's going to play music, can you come up now? Is that you? Come on, come on. And this is how we build ourselves up. Look, Jude 1, he says, listen, Jude 1, he says, building yourself up in the Holy Faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Stand with me if you would. Now, here's what I want to encourage you today. We want an increase of the presence of God. Amen? Amen. Yes? Yes. We want an increase of the presence of God in our lives. And so we want an increase of the measure of the anointing on the inside of us. We want to be able to to appraise things spiritually. And so we need to pray in the Holy Ghost. We need to pray in tongues. Now, we don't need to be, you know, get all super spiritual and start screaming in tongues around people and doing all kind of prophetic intercession saying, well, you just don't believe. You don't understand because you're not a believer. No, don't be obnoxious, right? None of the gifts are supposed to be obnoxious. But when the Spirit of God drops on you, we're not like, go to the bathroom and pray in tongues in this church. You know? No, pray, pray in the Holy Ghost. Don't scream in the Holy Ghost. And that's going to be like, can you just stop screaming? Like, oh, I can't control it. Well, we can cast it out if you like, because it's not God telling you to interrupt our service. One way or the other, someone's getting control of this thing. Was that rude, Sarah? I'm a lot feistier than I mean to be this service. I'm, I'm, I'm a little worked up. I'm going to Mexico, and I'm going to swing a rag and scream a lot. Mas fuego, Señor. It's going to be a lot of... Recibe. Recibelo. Recibelo. Refique su nombre, Señor. All right, so... Shaba. So listen, we want to pray in the Holy Ghost, but listen, we want to go from praying in the Holy Ghost of just mumbling stuff we don't understand to actually being connected to the Spirit of God on the inside of us. And actually we want to grow from being connected to the Spirit of God on the inside of us to allowing Him to make intercession through us. We want to learn to yield to Holy Spirit in our life so that we, as we yield to Him, He makes intercession through us. So the God of heaven is connected inside of us and actually it happens in a way that we don't have any control over. That's what we like. We want to let go of the control of Holy Spirit. Now, very briefly, I will teach on this later, but I just, some of you are going to get something very good here in a moment. And if you've not received your prayer language yet, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. I prayed for a whole lot of people before the first one got healed. I'm talking a lot of people, a lot of people I prayed for before anyone got healed. And then some would get healed, right? Like it took a long, a lot of effort. And I've given a lot of words that I ask people, does that make sense? And they're like, you know, that doesn't make any sense at all. I'm like, okay, that wasn't God. That was me. Got it. Like it's, you have to learn. Sometimes you got to learn. Sometimes God just supernaturally gives it to you. Sometimes you got to kind of learn it and lean into it. And so let me say this. If you've not received your prayer, just start praying in the Holy Ghost real quietly if you would. If you've not received your prayer language yet, first of all, don't give up. 
Number two, understand it's your prayer language, not God's. Don't expect God to pray it through you. Okay. God is not going to raise your children for you. Does that make sense? You have to actually, but God gave them to me. You don't say, well, he's going to raise them. You raise them. And we trust God to give us wisdom to raise them. Right? So you have to actually make noise and move your mouth. Right? And so, well, how will I know if, it, if, if I have it? Well, have you tried? I, 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 I like, well, have you tried? Well, I want it to be God. Well, that, what do you mean you want it to be God? You're the one who wants the gift. He already has a gift, right? He doesn't need the gift, right? He's God. You need the gift. So how do you know if you have a healing gift? You pray for people who are sick and you find out. How do you know if, I don't hear anybody praying in the Holy Ghost. I need y'all to help me out a little bit here. How do you know if you have the gift? How do you know if you've received your prayer language? Well, when you feel the presence of God, give it a shot. Give it a shot. Open your mouth and start making some noise and see if a language comes out of you you don't know. Now, most likely you're going to get one word at the beginning. That's how kids learn. Your little kid learned dad, 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 dad. And everything was dad, dad. My son, he would say da, bah. Everything in the house was da, bah. That's everything. What do you want? This, da, bah. This, da, bah. But like, what's the bat? I got to figure out what the bat is. It took me months because the bat was everything. But that's all he knew because he was a child. You're not going to get a full language. You might get a word. And if you keep using that word, you might get more words. Right? Shaba. Right? Ha. Shaba. This is a good word right here. This is good teaching. And so, listen, if you try to pray in the Holy Ghost and it doesn't work, you didn't fail. This means you ain't got it yet. What's so awful about that? You fail at lots of stuff, and you keep going after it. Some of those things are sinful things, and you just keep going after it. You can go after the Holy Ghost a little bit, amen? Corey, stand up here with me. I just feel like I need some more faith on this platform right now. Some outpouring, yeah, stand, yeah, come on. Stand next to him, Sarah. Oh, here we go. Now you're in for it. Watch out. Well, pastor, I've, I've been told, I've been told that you can't have tongues without an interpretation. Well, that's really kind of funny because my Bible right here in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 39 says to me, therefore, my brothers, desire earnestly to prophesy and don't forbid anybody to speak in tongues. Yeah. You're not supposed to have tongues in service. That's funny. If you wrote the Bible, I guess that'd be okay. But if you didn't, I'm going to go with the Bible. I'm going to go with the Bible. I understand. You ready, Corey? This is going to be pretty good. Here's what we're going to do. Shaba. I feel like some people are going to get filled right now and you get your prayer language. Turn up, the, turn up the keys just a little bit if you would, please. Ha. We're not going to raise our hands or anything. I just, I didn't, I didn't have this plan, but we're just going to do this. Uh, if you have received the gift, if you've received your prayer language, I like you, don't scream, please. It just is not necessary. But begin praying in the Spirit and just really begin to intercede that, whoa, that the Lord would move in the room right now. Shabbat. And put your hand on your belly to increase, like, I want, I want more of a river. The Bible says, out of your innermost being shall come rivers. And it will bubble up in your belly right now. And even if you haven't received your prayer language yet, Put your hand on your belly. And we're going to do something really spiritual. Close your eyes because all the spiritual stuff happens when your eyes are closed. So close your eyes. Ha. And if you've not received your prayer language yet, say, Lord, I see it in the Bible. And I believe the Bible. Well, let me start with this. If you're not saved, now's the time. Now's the time. Maybe you just need to crack the door and say, I'm open to it. Maybe I don't know everything I thought I knew. I'll be humble enough to say, I, maybe I was wrong. Ha. And just receive Jesus Christ because he's going to run through the door right now. He'll run through that crack. Shakaba. Now pray in the Holy Ghost. Now if you've never prayed in the Holy Spirit before, I want you to be brave in a moment. I'm going to pray for you, then I want you to be brave. Shakaba. Ministry team, come forward, please. I want you to be brave. I'm not going to call you out of your seat. That's for later. But I want the ministry team forward now. Shaba. You're staying right there. never prayed the Spirit, 
Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for those right now who've never prayed in the Spirit that you would give them their prayer language. Right now, in the name of... You feel that, Duke? Listen, Duke agrees with me. It's happening. He's taller than me, so it hits him before me. Now listen, if you haven't prayed the Spirit, just now you have to open your mouth and maybe just moan and see. See if he's giving you words. Oh, if you're clenching your tongue, you can't pray in tongues that way. So close your eyes, put your hand in your belly and say, Lord, I'm open to try. Lord, that you would fill them, right? And I believe the Lord is even activating some people in gifts even now. I saw a spirit of prophecy in the room, so I believe some people, you're going to get your, you're going to get your cloak, you're going to strike the waters this week and see if that thing works, and you're going to be amazed that it opens up. Some of you, you're going to be worshiping this week on the drive home, the spirit of God is going to fall on you, and you're going to begin to yell out in tongues. You're going to get filled. Come back and tell us about it. Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would fill, that it would bubble up, bubble up, bubble up, bubble up, bubble up, bubble up. I went way too long. Thank you for staying with me. Ha, bless you. Come on, can we celebrate that this morning? That's a good word, amen. Real quick before I dismiss you, I just want to encourage you, look, um, regardless of where you're at today, um, maybe you're away from God, maybe you've been saved for a long time, but you still don't pray in the Holy Spirit. I, you know, when I, when I first got here, I was 19 years old, and I got saved when I was younger in a Presbyterian church, and the thought of praying in tongues was bizarre to me. It really was. It was bizarre, and I, I came here, and I just got rocked by the, by, by the Lord and uh, set free from a bunch of stuff. But uh, the, the, in my head, praying in, in tongues just didn't make sense because it doesn't make sense. But I, um, I, I, I signed up for a life group the first week. I, 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 that week I got saved, about to fall off the stage. And I sat down with the life group leader and said, you got to explain praying in tongues to me. you got to show me where it is in the Bible because I just don't get it, you know. And he, he was pointing it out to me, and I was like, okay, you know, look, if it's God, I want it. And that's just where I was. I'm like, if it's God, I want it. And, and regardless of where you're at today, I would just encourage you to be at that place because the very next Sunday in worship, I go to sing a song and I start and it starts coming out of my mouth. And I don't know what happened. And so God will meet you right where you're at and he'll, give, he'll meet you right where you're at, but we all need to get to a place where if it's God, I want it. If it's God, I want it. Can we just pray that together, Father? Whatever's you, I want it in my life. I'm open to you, Jesus. Whatever you want to do, if it's you, I want it. I surrender. I surrender my pride, my intellect, my will to you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Hey, thank you guys so much for coming today. But pray for and bless the, the, the Mexico mission trip team this week um, as, as you're praying. Just keep them in your prayers. Let's just cover them as they go, amen. Let's give it up for Jesus one more time. We love you guys. Have an amazing Sunday, and we'll see you next week, amen. Hey, say hello to somebody as you leave, and if you need prayer, we got people up here who want to pray for you. Have an amazing day.